Divine. Yeah. What do you see? I see you. Oh, nice. Thank you. Now I only see the front desk. Okay. Okay, now I have an idea what you see. Just wanted to focus on the speaker who I will be. Okay. So uh, we shouldn't be unhappy of outnumbered. It means uh, we are in presence of cream of the crew. So here is the scale of what we are doing. So we have uh, three confirmed presentations and I think the first presenter will be Dr. Khan. I'll, I'll just tell a couple of words. Uh, so in In case you are here, uh, Daniel is not, is not going and, and the rest have already been there. So my words are probably to those who will be watching it on recording. Why do we go there? Main, what is the main reason to go to the conference? Is to get the feedback to your works. Because whatever we get informal feedback here in the closed group is biased maybe in a good sense but uh, we all know each other we are friends close colleagues and uh, you can predict what each of the group members can can ask approximately when you are exposed to an audience on a, on a true conference you do not know what you'll be asked and uh, it is a very helpful experience to very helpful experience to to hear the unbiased feedback so main goal is to, to get and memorize what you will be asked about record uh, eventually record questions and your answers and then it uh, they will form seed for the discussion session of section of your future paper so uh, you are getting not to brag with your achievements, but to collect ideas from visitors. Uh, here is the here is the list of posters. So you may recognize your name there or name or names of your. Uh, friends and, and colleagues. Thank you. Look. So, uh, if your travel schedule is in the terrible country with this uh, plan, one can make some arrangements with uh, organizers on site, but uh, preferably let's keep this schedule, it will be much easier to present whenever you are assigned. And if you are in doubt whether you want or you do not want to attend all, all uh, presentations, here is the schedule which you can find online. I know that in some research groups, it, it is considered sort of mandatory to attend everything. I, I'm talking on this more practical. Like one of the uh, most uh, uh, very productive group member, uh, Dr. Fogel, whom you've seen, when he came to Senegal for the first time, he just went to play golf. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, it didn't prevent him from uh, doing uh, nice research and, and nice papers. So you, you, may, you may look through the schedule and uh, identify what is worth of your attention and what you can uh, uh, skip for the for the sake of uh, going to beach or watching the zoo of 
turtles, which is nearby, or whatever. So, um, what, what is... Uh, first, I can identify a couple, couple. The first speaker is author of a very good DFT book. The um, first speaker of the Sunday uh, late afternoon session is uh, a developer of, of some theories that uh, everyone is uh, happy to listen to him, but his developments were done very many years ago. So it's, it, it, uh, some of the talks will not look like today's presentation. It will make the pen and paper or chalkboard things. Um, the Monday first speaker does adiabatic dynamics, but he, he will present on other session. Uh, the late morning on Monday, uh, Mark Gordon is author of uh, um, games program, who is a competitor of Gaussian. John Perdue is uh, letter P in many functionals, like uh, PW, uh, and those gentlemen also contribute to uh, density functional developments. The short talks after lunch, you can, some of you can see your boss here, right? Uh, and then there will be posters which will run until almost until midnight. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So on um, Tuesday, the last speaker on early morning is a very uh, pleasant person and eccentric speaker. But uh, other than that, I don't know if I will listen to the whole session. Uh, Angela Wilson is the big administrative person in uh, uh, either ACS or NSF. Now you can see some of your uh, uh, colleagues and friends. So uh, Stephanie, Josiah, if you saw him here, he was a, a grad student in Fargo a couple of years ago, and uh, John Fogel. And then there will be poster sessions again. Um, they set me up to chair the session, but I do not know the speakers. I will just re read their abstracts, and it's <laughs> not my profile, I don't know. <laughs> um, the uh, speaker before lunch, he is from University of Washington, and he didn't took me uh, as a postdoc at, his, at the time, so I'm not going him. And I do not see any close acquaintances or friends on uh, after lunch on, on Wednesday. And uh, the Wednesday have, has only one poster session until like uh, 6 or so, until 7.30, and then the, until like 6, right? 7.30. No. Yes. Not very long. There will be only one poster session. And on uh, Thursday, I do not know what the, the early morning is interesting, but I do not know the speakers. The uh, late morning, chaired by uh, David Misha, is uh, just by subject. Of initial molecular dynamics is something that we can uh, be very interested in. And uh, Todd Martinez is uh, one of the authors of competitive, competi competing, competing code that is neither surface hopping nor uh, density metrics and it works for um, their niche in the in the in the photo reactions. So he is able to stick in the multi configuration, multiple excitations into so it's uh, really interesting to listen what, what he did. <laughs> Uh, I 
I've heard this name and saw papers of this person about magnetism, but uh, I never saw it saw in person. And the last speaker before the banquet did really nice uh, papers on uh, perovskites, but I saw his talks. His papers are better than talks. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea about uh, Friday. So if you if you're looking to skip something, maybe Friday. Did you did you all completed uh, the um, travel plans? Like uh, place to stay and fight. Where is our plan? What was that? Where is our plan? I don't know, you guys are all around campus, aren't you? I could so just pick you up in the morning. I'll find it in the afternoon, right? I'll find it. Yeah. So we need to start over at like 7 or 7 and Yeah, that'll work. And I know a guy who works at a hotel, so he's. Hmm? I know a guy who like runs a hotel. No. So he's gonna. Oh, I'll hold my car for free and then oh, oh. it's only like five minutes from the airport, so nice So that. uh Jabad? Mm-hmm. What time do you guys land again? Uh six ten. Like six? Yep, six okay. ten I guess. And then the taxi will leave at like six thirty, right? He told me that he will be there at six fifteen. Okay. So I should make that. And does everyone have a ride, or are we going to be really packed in that car? Uh, no, uh, we will be seven in the car, yeah. Okay. Are you aware of anyone who is uh, not set up this? Uh, 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 no, I guess everyone's set up already. I emailed them, everyone, and then. So and the, and the graduates? Yeah, Austin and Christian, they, they make their arrangement. And Fatima, she is going that day, I guess. We're not in the center of the Okay. So okay. I don't know what's her arrangement from the Jackson Hill to there. Okay, so on, on the remaining of us. Austin, is, Christian, and Fatima who need special attention. Yeah. The rest are uh, set up. I guess only Fatima needs a special attention. Okay. So uh, please consider to make written comments. And uh, this is a uh, great opportunity uh, for Dr. Khan to be a formal speaker of the Department of Physics seminar. And uh, it is uh, suddenly, suddenly we realize that it, it will be in one week from now. So it will be the only time to practice. One week from now? Two weeks from now. Oh, okay. Right after this. Well, Sunnyville Week doesn't count. <laughs> no. It's like wiped off from our uh, activity. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, time dependent excited state molecular dynamics developed by our group to simulate uh, photoreduced chemical reactions. So, this technique has potential to model a broad range of chemical reactions including photofermentation and photopolymerization. So basically, in Dr. Kelly's group, there are two major research interests. The first one is photophysics, the second one is photochemistry. So for the photophysics, we are interested in... Uh, I will do something to the screen, do not get, uh, do, do not, uh, get scared. Okay. So okay. for the photophysics, we are interested in we are interested in the uh, photo-induced dynamics such as charge transfer, non-radiative charge carrier recombination in nanomaterials in order to better understand the photo attack and the photocatalytic solar energy conversion. For the photo for the photochemistry, we are interested in the bond breaking and bond forming uh, induced by photons. So I'm primarily working on the photochemistry project so today's talk will only focus on this area. 
Uh, and also, at the moment, these two areas are separated. But in future, we would like to make connections with these two. So to initiate chemical reactions, it is necessary to overcome the reaction barrier. And then there are several different ways to overcome the reaction barrier. And we have different computational methods to uh, describe this process. So for example, the, the chemical reactions can be triggered by thermal activation. And the corresponding uh, computational method would be traditional molecular dynamics. And in traditional molecular dynamics, the system is always in the ground state. The chemical reaction can also happen due to photon activation. In this case, we can use excited state molecular dynamics. So in excited state molecular dynamics, the electrons are promoted from ground state to a fixed excited state. And then the nuclear trajectory follows the excited state potential energy surface. So the chemical reaction might also take place due to uh, laser irradiation. So in this case, the laser sequentially excites the molecule and then induce a sequence of absorption and stimulated emission events. So uh, we need a higher level method than uh, excited state molecular dynamics to, des to describe it. And the method that we use is time-dependent excited state molecular dynamics. So this name is a little bit awkward because every molecular dynamics is time-dependent. But here we want to highlight the difference from traditional uh, ground state molecular dynamics and uh, excited state molecular dynamics. So the time-dependent excited state molecular dynamics should be interpreted as molecular dynamics with time-dependent electronic configurations. And uh, in TDSMD calculations, uh, electrons are hopping between ground state and excited state. So first, the electrons are promoted from ground state uh, to excited state, and then electrons are relaxing from excited state back to ground state. So this is called a rabbit cycle. TDSMD calculations consist of many rabbit cycles. During these rabbit cycles, the system uh, accumulates kinetic energy and finally uh, overcome dissociation barrier leading to photodissociation. So the TDSMD is implemented in DFT. So our main equation is one electron quotient equation. From here, <coughs> we can get uh, orbital, orbital energy. So the system experiences periodic excitation and de-excitations due to that two matter interaction term in total energy and in Fock matrix. So here, uh, the Fock matrix has three components. The first one is ground state Fock, and the second is non adiabatic coupling. The third one is that two matter interaction term. And uh, here we hypothesize that the non adiabatic coupling is uh, negligible. This is because uh, probability of electronic transitions induced by photons is much higher than the probability of electronic transitions induced by phonons. So the presence of a laser field induces rapid oscillations between state I and state G. So the rapid frequency is related to the transition dipole moment and also the intensity of electron field. So the occupation of orbitals experiences a change in time uh, due to rapid oscillations with rapid frequency. So here, the first panel shows an evolution of a density matrix induced by continuous wave excitation. The blue and the red represent the diagonal element of density matrix, while the yellow and purple represent the off-diagonal element of density matrix. So this is a little bit complicated. So we want to make a continuous transition from uh, CW excitation to a sequence of pi pulses. So as we can see in panel B, the average pulse area per uh, time interval is kept the same as in panel A. The occupation of one state swaps 
from uh, 1 to 0, and the occupation of excited state swaps from uh, 0 to 1. And for the uh, off diagonal element of density matrix, it is, it is not 0 during the pulse activity, but it is 0 uh, during the population period. So this means if we have a very short uh, if we have very short uh, hypothesis, then our TDSMD calculation would be accurate because we do, we do not need to worry about the off-diagonal element of the density matrix. And in most of, most of time, the system is either in ground state or in the excited state. So the time evolution of electronic degrees of freedom can be calculated by solving the equation of motion according to the first equation. So the first term is fork density, fork operator, the second is density operator, the third is uh, dissipative transitions. Due to optically driven rabbit oscillations induced by a sequence of pi pulses, we have a stepwise change in the occupation of interacting orbitals. So from here, we can update the uh, electron density with new densities, we can update interatomic forces. With new forces, we can calculate the position of ions. So in this way, the electronic degrees of freedom represented by density matrix and the nuclear degrees of freedom represented by position of ions are coupled. Okay, here, let's look at some applications of TDSMD calculations. Uh, okay. Yes, okay to, to interrupt. Mm -hmm. I, I do not have specific questions. Well, I have several, no, no, but do not hesitate to stop and ask. If you have been to a physics seminar, they, they are nice people, they're not aggressive, but they're curious. And especially during the methodology, they will stop you several times and ask uh, definitions or some derivations, so you may prepare backup slides. And now, if anyone of us has questions, do not hesitate to uh, stop and ask or record question to ask later. So Aaron may ask how the uh, dynamics of two-level system was propagated under light and how two-level system refers to multi-electron molecule. Are you prompting me? <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's continue. We'll go through questions later. So the most, power, the most part of this talk will focus on last slide cyclobendodyno complexes. This is because TDSMD is originally developed to assist the interpretation of the photofragmentation of this specific compound. But still I'll talk about photofragmentation of some organic molecules by TDSMD, as well as photopolymerization of cyclohexacylene by TDSMD calculations. So to study the photofragmentation of last night's cyclobendodyno complexes, we have two methods. The first one, so experimentally we can use photoionization time flight mass spectrometry to get the mass spectrum of the compound. And in the mass spectrum, we have several features. Based on these features, we can propose the photofragmentation mechanism. And the computationally, we can just use time-dependent excited state molecular dynamics. And in TDSM new trajectories, we have many dissociation events so these events can help us to evaluate or to justif justify the photofragmentation mechanism proposed based on experimental data. So here I show one example of TDSMD trajectories. Okay, so here let me briefly talk about the setup for photoionization time flight mass spectrometer. Uh, in the bottom, we have a diffusion pump, and in the middle, this is a TOF chamber. In the inside the chamber, we have a sample holder. So the last night cyclobendodyno complexes is loaded in the sample holder. And here we have several grids. These grids are charged. They are used to accelerate the ions. And the green is the laser system. The laser is used to 
fragment the molecule as well as to ionize them. Uh, the laser we use is the near DNA DR laser, and the wavelength is usually 266 nanometer. And above it, we have a flight tube. At the top, we have a turbo pump and a detector. So with turbo pump and diffusion pump, we can make sure uh, the pressure in the chamber is very low. So we expect there are no collision between molecules. So the time flight uh, mass spectrometer is based on the principle that ions with different mass to charge ratio will take a different time to travel certain distance in the instrument after being accelerated to the same kinetic energy. Based on, by measuring the time, we can, look, we can determine the mass to charge ratio of a specific ion. Here I show a short video about QF experiments. Okay, so when laser interacts with the molecule, the molecule will fragment and then ionize. And the ions with small mass to charge ratio will reach the detector very, very, very quickly. Uh, at a later time, ions with large mass to charge ratio will arrive. So for less size cyclopental dyno complexes, we are focusing on two specific Compounds. The first one is last night CP3, and the second one is last night ICP3. So the difference is uh, for the ICP, we have isopropyl group on the carbon ring. Why we are interested in last night cyclopentadieno complexes? Well, the first reason is they are very popular in uh, organometallic chemistry, and the second is they are potential precursors to prepare last night oxide thin films. Uh, in chemical vapor, in laser assisted chemical vapor deposition technique, and uh, the last night oxide thin film have many applications. Uh, one problem of using last night cyclopentadieno complexes to prepare last night oxide thin film is carbon contamination. So, by studying the photofragmentation of this compound, we can determine the contamination source and we can even control the contamination. Here I calculated the absorption spectral of last night ICP3 using these equations. And uh, we are focusing on one specific transition, transition from homo minus two to lumo plus 11. Uh, here I also show the partial charge density of evolved orbitals. orbitals. So for homo minus two, the charge density is mainly focused on the ligand, and for LUMO plus 11, the charge density is focused on the metal. So the, charge, so the transition from HOMO minus 2 to LUMO plus 11 has a ligand to metal charge transfer character. This is very important because in, in experiment, we have evidence that only photo excitation into ligand to metal charge transfer state is responsible for the photofragmentation of this compound. So in the following TDSMD calculations, this transition will be used as initial excitation. Here I show the uh, experimental uh, photo ionization time fly mass spectra of last night ICB3. Uh, panel A, B, and C corresponding to different metals. Uh, in all spectra, the dominant peak is bare metal. We also observe left side ICP3, left side ICP2, and the left side ICP. So, uh, based on the mass spectra, there are two major dissociation pathways. The first one is so called ligand ejection, where the ICP ligand sequentially ejected from the metal through three steps of ligand to metal charge transfer events. So, uh, starting with last night ICP3, after three steps of LMCT processes, we end up with bare metal. And our TDSMD calculations capture this process quite well. So here, this is a geometry optimized model of last night ICP3. 
This is used as input for TDSMD calculations. So here we can see one ligand is ejected. As time goes by, the second ligand is ejected. And finally, all three ligands are ejected. So in the middle, we have the bare metal. The other dissociation pathway is uh, ligand cracking. So in the mass spectrum, here I show the expanded mass spectrum in the low mass regime. And in the mass spectrum, there are two kinds of species, species with even number of hydrogens and species with odd number of hydrogens. So species with odd number of hydrogens come from that side ICP1, but species with even number of hydrogens come from that side ICP1 minus hydrogen. So the detailed photofermentation pathway of living cracking is very complicated. I'm not going to talk, focus on it, but instead I will just focus on one branch. So we propose last side ICP1 minus hydrogen come from last side ICP2. In this case, the ejected ICP ligand extract a hydrogen from ligand remains bound, being as a closed shell HICP molecule. So we end up with last ICP minus hydrogen. And our TDSMD calculations uh, capture this process, process as well. So at 1578 from the second, we can see a hydrogen atom is ejected from the top ICP ligand. As time goes by, this hydrogen move closer to the ICP ligand at bottom left. As we can see here at this time, uh, the hydrogen forms a bridge between the metal and the uh, ICP ligand at the bottom left. In the following trajectories, uh, the hydrogen migration uh, is completed and we have a closed shell HICP molecule. And this HICP molecule drift away from the metal. So if we take the ICP ligand on the bottom right as a spectator, then this, this species uh, is less than ICP1 minus hydrogen. It has the same chemical composition as our proposed structure. So in addition to justify the proposed photofermentation mechanism, TDSMD trajectories can also be used to predict the mass spectrum. So here I show comparison of experimental mass spectrum and the simulated mass spectrum. So we can see the simulated mass spectrum uh, are the same as the experimental mass spectrum in terms of peak position. And also for spectra D and E, not only the peak position, even the peak intensity is almost similar. So here I only focus on the high mass regime. For the low mass regime, we can build the mass spectrum uh, by performing TDSMD calculations uh, using the important intermediates that side ICP1. Okay, so as we can see, the simulated mass spectrum is in qualitative agreement with experiment data. Uh, we can also analyze the properties of intermediates from TDSMD trajectories. And I should point out that TDSMD calculations generate hot intermediates with excessive kinetic energy. So to remove the kinetic energy or to cool them off, we need to apply a post-processing technique. So basically, after the completion of TDSMD calculations, we extract intermediates from TDSMD trajectories and then we draw geometry optimization. This process is independent of TDSMD calculations and thus it has no interference to our original results. So by, after we perform this technique, we end up with code intermediates and we can get lots of information from these code intermediates. For example, we can build the energy diagram. 
from this energy diagram, we can get that cativation energy for several reaction steps. And here I'm going to do something interesting. So this is a simplified version of energy diagram from previous slide. So here I include new data points just to save numerical efforts. So we want to relate numbers of different types of bonds to the total energy of intermediates. So basically, at each, for each intermediate, we analyze the number of bonds. For example, for the uh, initial intermediate, we have five uh, metal carbon bonds, five carbon carbon bonds, five carbon hydrogen bonds, but none metal hydrogen bond. We then do a regression analysis using this equation. By doing that, we end up with some uh, coefficients. With these coefficients, we can do the curve fitting. And here, the blue shows the fitted curve. This is very interesting because it suggests we can predict the uh, total energy of intermediates without any initial data. Okay, so at the moment, TDSMD is implemented in DFT. In future, we would like to recode TDSMD with more advanced methods, such as multi-reference method. However, such coding will work, will require lots of computational resources. So instead, we just analyze the intermediates uh, using MD2 method, and uh, our observation is the qualitative pattern of barrier heights is the same. So another example is TDSMD calculations on a small organic molecule physically absorbed on carbon nanotube. So the molecule we are working on is dinitromethane molecule. It is an important import. It is an important component and intermediates in energetic materials. So here I show the basic electronic structures uh, of the hybrid system as well as the isolated system. So here this is isolated dinitromethane molecule, this is isolated carbon nanotube, and this is, a, this is a hybrid system. So basically the density of states for the hybrid system is just a combination of the isolated system. So in other words, all features in panel B and E can be found in panel H. And uh, the calculated absorption spectrum of the hybrid system is identical or similar to the calculated absorption spectrum of the isolated carbon nanotube. And here we can identify several transitions So our goal of this work is to uh, find out if charge transfer events facilitate the photofermentation of organic molecules on carbon nanotube. So here I show uh, the charge density for orbitals involved in these transitions. As we can see, for the first two transitions, the transfer, the transition has charge transfer character from carbon nanotube to the molecule. But for the third transition, it has charge transfer character from the molecule to the carbon nanotube. And then we use these transitions as initial uh, conditions for TDSMD calculations. And here is our result. And we found only the first two uh, trajectories had have photo excitation, have photo fermentation events. So this means the charge transfer event is very important in determining the photofermentation pathway. Uh, I should also mention that transition gamma has the largest transition energy, but we do not observe any fermentation. This means transition energy plays a secondary role in determining the reaction pathway. So the third application is photofermentation of tetranitromethane molecule. 
So the tetranitro methyl molecule has many applications. For example, they can be used as nitric region uh, and explosives. There are many experimental studies on the photofermentation of this molecule. However, the theoretical study is not available. And for previous applications, TDSMD calculations is based on spin restricted DFD. Uh, in fact, the photofermentation might involve open shell radicals or intermediates. So this time, TDSMD calculations will be based on spin unrestricted DFD. And here, this time we consider two cases. The first one is neutral TM, the second one is uh, TM cation. For the neutral system, spin up and spin down components are the same because of spin paired electrons. So we only consider spin up transitions for TDSMD calculations. But for the cation, spin up and spin down component, components are different. So both spin up transitions and spin down transitions are included in TDSMD calculations. So, and also in this case, we do not consider spin flip transitions. To do spin flip transitions, we need a higher level. We need to do non-collinear spin DFT, which we might pursue in future. <laughs> so here is a, a energy diagram based on TDSM trajectories, starting with neutral TNM. Uh, as we can see, with increase of time, we see the increasing of carbon-nitrogen bound distance. So initially, we have four nitro groups. As time goes by, uh, two nitro groups are ejected. And here, we end up with two nitro groups on the carbon. Uh, in the following trajectory, we see isomerization of this species. Uh, due to this isomerization, this species can lose nitrogen uh, monoxide as well as carbon monoxide. So the final product consists of gas phase components. We have uh, carbon monoxide, nitrogen monoxide, and the three nitrogen dioxide. And also from the energy diagram, we can get activation energy for these reaction steps. Here I calculated the total energy of initial reactant, transition state, as well as final product using for different trajectories using different functionals. And uh, as is expected, the activation energy varies with the choice of functional. But still, for the neutral system, the total energy of a final product is greater than the initial reactant. But for the cation system, uh, the total energy of final product is less than the reactant. So we can also extract TDSMD, we can also extract mass spectrum from TDSMD trajectories. So here, as a reference, the spectral D is the experimental electron ionization mass spectrum. So in all cases, the most dominant peak is nitrogen dioxide peak, as I show here. And uh, for panel A, we found the molecular ion is quite strong, but for panel B and C, the molecular peak is quite weak. This is because the ionization makes the carbon-nitrogen bond last longer, and thus the bonding is weaker. For the experimental mass spectrum, we do not observe this molecular ion peak. This is because high energy electron impact creates high energy molecular ion, which can very quickly dissociate. Okay, so the final application would be for the polymerization of cyclohexane slain by TDSM calculations. So cyclohexane slain has attracted much attention because it has been used as silicon sources to prepare silicon continuum materials uh, such as silicon nanorods, silicon thin films, through liquid-based methods. CHS is also a good alternative to traditional monosilane in chemical vapor deposition technique. 
So the preparation of cyclohexane slain, the preparation of silicon continue, con continuing materials using uh, cyclohexane slain follow a general chemistry. So uh, basically due to heat treatment or UV treatment, the cyclohexane slain can transform into hydrogenated polyslane uh, through ring opening polymerization with additional thermal treatment. There are several bond breaking events such as the breaking of silicon silicon bond or breaking of silicon hydrogen bond. So we end up with amorphous silicon. So the amorphous silicon can also transform into crystallized silicon with additional heat or laser excitation. So the ring opening polymerization has been captured by the experimentalists, but still the theoretical study is not available. So to better understand the photochemistry as well as to uh, design more efficient fabrication method, it is necessary to perform theoretical studies. So we want to model ring opening polymerization of liquid cyclohexylene, but it will require huge amount of computational resources, so it is not realistic. Instead, we model an uh, oversimplified model. This time, we, our simulation cell consists of two CHS molecules, and we consider two placement configurations, face-to-face uh, -face and side-by-side. -side. And we compute the absorption spectrum for both of them. And uh, here is the result. And we found there is no absorption in the visible range. This picture shows uh, the liquid cyclohexylene, and we can see it is transparent. So this means our calculation is in qualitative agreement with experiment data in terms of uh, absorption. And from absorption spectra, we can find three specific transitions, and these transitions are used in TDSMD calculations. So here I show uh, the trajectory of TDSMD calculations based on face-to-face -face configuration. This is a, a unprocessed trajectories, which means the intermediates are still hot. So for the first half of the simulation, the kinetic energy accumulated is quite small, so we only observe limited reaction events. We only observe the breaking of silicon hydrogen bond. we find rich reaction events in the second half of the trajectories. So we can observe the breaking of silicon silicon bond. We can see the breaking of the ring structures. Okay, so the dimerization happens at the very last stages of TDSM trajectories. Okay, so next we analyze the properties of co intermediates. Here I show some examples. So at 16, 26 from the second, we can see the formation of dimer. At 1980 from the second, we see two hydrogens ejected from the dimer. And in the middle, we have a special silicon. The coordination number for this silicon is four, so which is typical in amorphous silicon. We also find the band gap decreases with increasing of uh, 
reaction time. So initially, the band gap is about five electron volts, but the band gap for the final product is about two electron volts. So we also calculate the emission spectrum uh, for this intermediates. What we did is we perform additional adiabatic molecular dynamics at room temperature based on the cold intermediates. And here is the equation for uh, the emission spectrum. So this equation accounts for fluctuation of quantum orbital energies due to thermal motion of a nuclei. By using this equation, we have seen there is instantaneous relaxation of any excitation to the lowest excited state. So basically we see emission is from is always from lumo to homo. From this figure we can see a red shift and also the light waste broadly. Okay, so finally we can build the simulated mass spectrum. So the dominant peak is the monomer, silicon six, hydrogen twelve. Uh, for the first spectral, we also observe the dimer peak, silicon twelve, hydrogen twenty four. But this dimer peak is missing for spectral B and spectral C. So this is because uh, for the simulation starting with face to face configuration, dimerization happens before dehydrogenation. But for simulation starting with side by side configuration, dehydrogenation happens before dimerization. In addition to the monomer peak and the, the dimer peak, we also observe other species. So species at the left correspond to fragments with molecular weight less than the monomer, and the species at the right corresponding to fragments with molecular weight uh, higher than the monomer. So basically, so this part can be understood as, as fragmentation, and this part can be taken as polymerization. Okay, so to conclude, TDSMD calculations predict reasonable distribution of fragments, and also TDSMD has potential to model a broad range of photo abuse chemical reactions, including photopolymerization. Yeah, that's it. Okay, that's, thank you. <laughs> so any questions are very welcome, because uh, in the physics seminar, audience will not sit silent. They, they, they will stop during the first three minutes and we will not let you speak uh, freely. Uh, you loon? Uh -huh. uh, question slash comment. Is there any way that you can speed up the videos? Because I know that I think you have three and for the three a lot of the time you just stood there and didn't say anything. So if you made it shorter, you wouldn't have as much dead time. Is there a way to do that? Or is it, is there a reason why they're so long? I can't make it shorter. It's not a problem. Levi? Uh, yes. I would like to argue with you uh, in, the, in the following sense. The uh, long videos allow to attract attention and allow to give uh, details of uh, of the of the processes. So maybe one can keep long videos and fill the whole period with uh, explanation. Look here. Yeah. He, yeah, and that that's fine. It was just I think this is his the first time going through. So I just wanted to point out there was a lot of dead time where he could have explained what was going on and draw our attention to what's important, if that makes sense. Yes. <laughs> Alisa may ask what, your, what the talk was about. <laughs> <laughs> So 
I have a comment, uh, not comment actually, it's my feeling. So what's the purpose of slide 9 and 10? I guess it's just easy necessary to explain this all experimental setup and thing. Do not like this explanation? I mean, how is it related with this theoretical talk? It's just my my thought, I'm not saying. It, it, it is so exciting. Do you know how the charge of electron was measured? Charge of electron? No. No. I mean, in experimental In, in, in experiment, yes. So it, it is an exciting reading to, to read. And this, exper this experiment is very similar. So it, uh, the acceleration depends on ratio of mass mm. and, and charge. And it is really versatile, exciting tool to see. No, so so uh, one can make um, the yeah. connection to experiment and measuring charge mm. and see it, it, it is very, it will be very close to heart of any physicist. Yeah, yeah the slide itself is important to me. I mean, I feel like that, but if I consider like previous slide and the next slide is kind of disconnected, I, I feel in my feelings just like that. If what? I want to connect with Which slide one? 8 and 9 and 10 and 11, it's kind of not that much connected to me. 8 and 9 and 10 and 11. So it just seems like an abrupt transition, just to put okay. it instead of it being like a full mm -hmm. narrative. So you, want, you, you do want an introductory sentence. Like, if you are a teacher in kindergarten, you need to say, and then, after theory, I want to tell you a story how one can measure it. Right? <laughs> You said you have all the features of the dinitromethane and then the carbon nanotube that they both appear in the combined system? Yeah. So is your energy axis the same for all three? Yes, it's the same. So, so what ca causes the shifting of the peaks? You say all the peaks are there, but they're just kind of in different energy spots. Yes. And what is the distance with the tube with that molecule? It's about four angstrom. Four angstrom. And the next slide actually is showing the actually in slide 13 and 14. I know that you already mentioned that all naming and everything, but when you describe that figure, yeah, so it's very hard to follow the description without there any image actually, for actually it would be very hard for physicists who doesn't know any chemicals or anything names, yeah. So, you mean add some explanations? Not, not explanation, I mean visual like molecules or which one is CIS or which part is... Well, just uh, uh, how much the screen and show by fingers or uh, like this atom moves here and it is really cool. Mm -hmm. some, uh, because uh, molecules of this size are not in the background education mm -hmm. of, of any physicist. Mm -hmm. Just uh, teach audience how to follow uh, these images. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. 
think we are, we are listening to each other here. No, in, in slide 20, actually, I was present. In one transition, is showing that is in a charge transfer from the tube to that molecules, and another one is showing the charge transfer from mole, to, uh, molecules, that ligand molecules to the tube. Uh, what is the reason of this one? Is so one excitation is not following any. One excitation is reduced, and another oxidizing in respect to the molecule, and maybe oxidizing or reducing have different influence on their uh, reactions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Which was is, the, is yeah, I'm, just, I'm just I'm just wondering because if I wanna like uh, try to find out any trends, like something is more reducible is one fragment is oxidizing but it's happening both in this case so what do you mean by happening both because they have a in different transition is can happening in the either side is putting the transition based on the transitions because first transition is one direction and the last transition is happening in the opposite direction but still the first two has charge transfer character from common attitudes on the molecule right for the third transition, only charge transfer from molecule to tube. Uh, yeah, what is that happening right? to change that? Yet? What is the specialty of that transition? Is change the charge transfer direction? Ah, uh, I think before. So right now, you are just ordered from transition energy. So the first one has smallest transition energy. Okay. And the bottom one has the largest transition energy. So what really matters is charge transfer instead of transition energy and determine uh, the photofermentation. No, my question is why are you changing the direction of charge transfer, not the why charge transfer? Just to test which charge transfer event will facilitate the photofermentation. We intentionally choose this. Yeah, but my curiosity was in the first one is Charge transferring from tube to ligand, but in the other one is transferring from ligand to tube. So my curiosity is how, why, or how we changing the charge transfer directions or I mean turn. First two alpha and beta mm -hmm. communicate additional charge to the ligand. Okay. So. It, uh, negative charge, electron, it reduces molecule. Mm -hmm. Third type of transition removes charge from the molecule, it oxidizes it. So a reduced molecule is more reactive than oxidized. What, what, what else? Yeah, then, if, yeah, that's my question. Why are you changing their activity in based on the transitions? I mean, maybe I can't see what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> who understands? Who, who does understand the question of geography? In the first transitions, one species is reducing, like, I mean, ligand is more reactive, right? In the first transition. Your, your question can be split on, uh, you cannot spend too much time, but your question can be split on two parts. First, how come that different excitations facilitate different directions of charge transfer? Yeah, that's my only question. It is, uh, there is no science in it. Uh, there is both occupied and unoccupied are randomly distributed over molecule and nanotube. Yeah. And you select different pairs, which can be either one or another direction, or neutral. And you select only those that uh, do have non-zero oscillator strengths. Or nearly non zero. No, nothing else. I, I don't know what can be. I, I don't know. I'm just curious to see this one. There's more questions? I have one question. Oh, please. please. Uh, so it's uh, on the slide 15. So uh, in 13 and 14, you showed that um, in the experimental result, right? Right? Mass spectra. And the <coughs> 15 is uh, your 
simulation result, right? So can you please explain how they are correlated? 15 and the what? And like you, you wrote uh, something experimental. And the in high mass region and this one is a uh, low mass region. Yes. If you correlate uh, your simulated mass spectra with the experimental uh, one, so how they are similar or different? What's the relation there? You, you're asking why the simulated mass spectra is uh, similar so, so to the experimental data? So you can you data? simulated right mass spectra and uh, you got uh, from experiments. So why, like both you, you got something similar or dissimilar, or like uh, they are related somehow, right? So, so you're asking uh, to guide you as a visitor of this uh, talk through the data, show which peak to look at? Mm -hmm. yeah. Was it yeah. your question? Yep. Yeah. So it, it is, and that this, okay. this panel. Okay, I will try to, to answer, uh, uh, and you you tell if if it is what you you meant. Look at this data. Here is experiment. Here is the computational data. Mass spectrum is dependence of occurrence of a molecule. If there are many molecules of different masses, as function of their mass. So, this peak shows that the molecule is. Uh, Molecular mass to 10 occurs with this percentage. Here is computed, uh, here is computed, here is measured. They, their position is the same, their height is different. Okay. Same but position is good, different heights is not good. But this one, this three panels for huh? simulation, right? Upper one. Experiment. Two lower ones, simulation. The simulated mass spectra and experimental mass spectra. Okay. So he is comparing this, this simulation. Okay, okay. Okay, does it answer? I thought the three panels for simulation and the 13 and 14. So three. the abbreviation here, PI minus TOF, stands for experimental method. Oh, so instead of in write experiment. Ah. Okay? okay? Okay, I see now. <laughs> It's not clear on this slide, so. No. More questions? Oh, I forgot the one you found. <laughs> 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 uh, what was it? There was oh, why can you use Robbie cycle for multi-level systems? Because you described it as two-level. So how do you implement it as multi-level? How do you, or another way to say is, how do you choose which states that you populate? And then you cycle through. Depends on our needs, I guess. Especially for last or second final day, the we choose like to make a charge transfer state. Mm -hmm. As long as it is one is on ligand, one is on ladder. Okay. So. I mean, for the multi-level, you are suggesting they should include a relaxation channel? Not necessarily that. So, so if you have a two-level system, all you have is just two levels to choose. So if you have multi-level systems, like how do you choose which pair of those to do the excitation for? Or how do you choose to do homo minus two to lumo plus four? Oh, you do, you do, you do. You can uh, lie a little bit and tell the three transition that gives high rest weight of strength is always good to excite. This is a straight idea. Sometimes there are tricks that some uh, other transitions are also interesting. But first idea is just look which of the transitions have high rest weight of strength. At a cer certain wavelength, they will be excited first. Okay? Mm -hmm. Logical? Yep. I have a question. Mm -hmm. If uh, I'm a stranger and I'm seeing it for the first time and I like, like it so much, how can I write this? Or how can I run the simulation for my system? Is it a public software or should I pay or where can I get access to it? 
just talk to us, we can collaborate. <laughs> okay. But uh, I think you had, there will be provocative questions that you don't, don't expect. Okay, so let's, uh, if there are no more questions or you decided to just write them down, let's thank Dr. Khan once again. So, uh, this uh, submit your feedback if you wrote anything. And uh, general suggestion about presenting, it is uh, much more appealing to audience if, if you approach the screen and if you approach the audience, no matter what, what you present. Uh, so many thanks to those of you who decided not to present today. Therefore, we have so relaxed schedule without rush. So uh, we do have poster by Alisa, and it is uh, final version. Ah, uh, forget Ho that. Hopefully. Yeah, well, I have to add a concluding point, but I'm like, I'm, I'm getting there. I don't know. I feel like a little kid using big words. I don't know. Tell me why he's here today. So we can yeah, he can tell me all this stuff I did wrong. It'll be great. <laughs> no, I won't do that. Hey, Dimitri. Yes. Can you zoom in on the poster? Don't you see the poster itself on your uh, shirt? No, they don't have that hooked up. <laughs> Do you see anything changing? Yeah, I see me. Now it should transfer poster. I don't see anything. Okay. Uh, I will try to zoom in after distributing materials. Okay. okay, thank you. Another problem. Do you have the um, link, online link to the PDF? I didn't get an email. You should. On the Google Drive. Oh, now I did. I okay. looked before, never mind. Okay, and I'll suggest a second, please do not be scared. Something may change how the visual appears. I know it's Sometimes if you focus and try to speak and then uh, uh, stuff changes. Oh, great. I can see how wonderful I look today. I tried hard. I dressed up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We good? Yep. Okay. Well, basically, uh, my uh, research is on cadmium sulfide quantum dots. So first of all, I skipped like all of this last time, so I'm going to go over it. Um, why colloidal quantum dots? So there's two different, well, there's probably more, but the two that I know are colloidal and the plasma, I think is what it's called. But colloidal is made from crystals uh, and solvents and that kind of thing. And uh, plasma is made from gas. And it's way more expensive and it's a lot harder to produce. So uh, we're doing research on the colloidal quantum dots. And um, just why quantum dots in general, uh, because depending on their size and the ligands that they're passivated in, they can have different optical properties. So that's what we're looking at today. Um, so the two main ligands that um, I'm taking into consideration are thiol and thiolate. Uh, previously, there's been research done with carboxylic ligands, uh, but it's been proven that thiol has a better um, that has better optical properties than uh, carboxylic, so I'm looking into thiolate as far as uh, this quantum dot. Um, but the one issue is that thiol can be deprotonated into thiolate, which has a lower quantum yield um, and just uh, is not as uh, optically active as thiol. So we're looking into how different solvents affect the deprotonation of thiol into thiolate. So the two solvents that I use are acetonitrile and propylamine. Uh, propylamine is the nonpolar solvent, while acetonitrile is the polar solvent. Um, and yeah. And so basically, what I'm trying to get out of this whole thing is how the uh, quantum dot and ligand interactions uh, change in different solvents, and how the uh, the effects of the like, the quantum dot ligand interactions um, have on the optical properties of the system. So uh, my structure is a 1.5 nanometer. Uh, Sphere-ish is cut from wartzite, so it's not a sphere, it's ish. Um, and then it is passivated with either one thiolate and no amines, or like thiol or thiolate, or one ligand, and then uh, 
either has 20 amines or has no amines. Uh, you can see that down here. This is the uh, amines with like the one thiol, which is here, or thiolate or whatever is on the surface. And then um, otherwise it can be passivated with solely one thiol or thiolate. Um, this is not in real life, it's a, this doesn't happen, uh, but this is just observed so that we can figure out um, the, the optical properties, uh, specifically that correlate to one thiol or thiolate. Um, anyways, the, uh, the other option that can be used is full passivation by the ligands, which are thiol or thiolate, um, and that is seen in this box here, uh, where all uh, of the spots are filled up by the ligands, so there'd be 21 thiols or thiolates, um, depending on how that worked out, uh, of what I decided to do. Okay, so the reason, oh wait, no, I'm going back here. Um, so first of all, the geometry was optimized uh, with whatever ligands were on the structure. Um, using the functionals and bases, if you really care, you can look at it. Um, and then the binding energy was found, uh, as, long as, as well as the absorption spectra using the uh, Gaussian distribution um, for the curve and stuff, so um, for GDFD. Anyways, um, so focusing on the transition between thiol and thiolate, um, on your thing you can probably see, but up here it's kind of hard to point out, um, this sulfur is less electronegative than this sulfur down here. That can be seen here and here. So the proton is pulled to the surface sulfur uh, because it is more electronegative and is, um, is more stable that way. And even after the proton moves to the surface, the surface sulfur is still more electronegative than the surf, uh, sulfur in the thiol, uh, thiolate then. Um, so it stays there, relatively speaking. Okay, um, and then I have my binding energies from the ligand to the quantum dot. Um, all in all, acetonitrile generally moves up the binding energy so it's less negative uh, by about like 0.5 to 1 eV, depending on what it is. Um, but the neutral thiolate plus the proton, so uh, this looking system here, um, is pretty much unaffected no matter if there's a uh, mean or no mean on the quantum dot um, on which solvent it's in. Uh, but the negative thiol, thiolate and the, the neutral thiol are both severely affected by the lack of amine in acetonitrile. So what happens is what I'm thinking happens um, is when the amine is taken off and there's only one thiol on the surface uh, or thiolate or um, whichever one those is, are the thiol thiolates, um, that the binding energy becomes um, like it's more favorable for the ligand to not be on the surface of the quantum dot and for it to be kind of pushed away into the solvent or at least not severely, like, not seriously found. Would it be correct to say that uh, binding energy becomes stronger in polar solar? Um, no, other way around. So the more negative the binding energy, the stronger the bond is to the quantum dot. So this becomes, it's like a, like it's less bound to the surface, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, so basically just as trends that you can see is that amine is necessary for the, um, for acetonitrile, for thiol and thiolate with that, like, um, so that it, like it's kind of stayed on the surface. Otherwise it could float off. I don't really know the technical term for that, but anyways. Um, and then here we can see the, um, Bond distances. So this is specifically between the cadmium and the sulfur of the ligand. So between, uh, you can't see the cadmium; it's underneath here, uh, and the sulfur. So um, uh, it's pretty much thiolate is fairly unaffected uh, by the change in solvent because the empty symbols are acetonitrile and the filled symbols are um, are propylamine. So these two here, it's hard to see on here, but these two are the acetonitrile and they're relatively speaking higher than like longer bond distance than um, the um, propylamine, which are here and here. Um, this is a weird case. I don't really have an explanation for it. Um, I tried to figure it out. I, I don't know. I have to ask some more questions. Um, but this correlates to the, the thought that the binding energy decreases uh, in acetonitrile because the bond length is slightly larger for the cadmium than sulfur. Um, and then in, I drew a nice little picture because I was getting confused. Um, so 
for a thiol. This is the hypothetical bond, or like it's not, this is not a bond here, which you can see on your graph, but up here you can't see the difference. Um, so this is between the proton and the surface, and this is between the proton and the ligand, and then over here, this is the surface and the proton, and then this is the surface and the ligand. So that's why there's like varying differences as far as distance, is because I put the proton on the surface, so the distance is going to be larger. Yeah. Um, so in, in the panel that you had discussing, uh -huh. center, you have the x-axis with A, B, C, D. Oh, shoot, I forgot that. And, okay. on, and on the lower left, panel A, you have definition of this A, B, C, D. Yeah. But can you, if, uh, if I have no connection with surface science or do not understand figures, can you explain what are these A, B, C, D and <coughs> how they are different? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can roughly explain it. Obviously, yeah. my knowledge is not vast. Um, but based on previous experiments, not Fatima, my work. Fatima will be uh, best expert to check if you are telling right or wrong. Okay, well, <laughs> correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. Um, because like, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure on previous experiments, uh, the best way to differentiate between which layers and which uh, like which parts of the quantum dot were being interacted with was by, to separate them into specific layers so that you can put certain things on certain layers and then you can observe the effects and whether or not different parts of the quantum dot have a different effect on the ligands. Yes? Ish? What, 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 so what, what is a... Go ahead, go ahead, Levi, please. Uh, so what is, how do you define a layer? Because is it Because like di di different, the side of, uh, different side of a mushroom, it is the best example of uh, Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think it, you just have to pick one, and then just, like, I, I'm not 100% sure. I think you just pick it and keep it constant, but I might be wrong. Yeah. Is that so, right? so I'm cutting when we cut it from bulk, right? Uh -huh. Layer A and C have three coordinated sulfur, uh, three coordinated, I think, sulfur, and two coordinated cadmium, right? Okay. So that is a very important key when you're talking about these because that would dictate a lot of things about binding energy. Well, and if you do it with, what? Are you talking about like what's on the outside? Yeah, okay. so we don't really care about what's in the core yeah. of the quantum dot. We care about the surface, okay. right? Yeah. And to easily differentiate between different surface types, we did A, B, C, and D because each uh, surface type has a very specific environment around it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. Levi, what is surface type? So, uh, if we look at the coordination number in the box system, what is how many atoms are coordinated around? So, like, how many sulfurs on the outside, or like how many cadmium? Or yeah, so if we look at a cadmium in bulk, how many sulfurs are attached to it? Okay, it is one uh, definition, and uh, there is another one uh, from the uh, point of view of professional crystallographers. So if you if you yes, take this uh, if you take this bulk uh, crystal, you can assume that it is a piece of cheese, and and cut it with a sword at different angles. And when you do cutting at different angles, it will expose different coordination numbers. And uh, for simple guys like us, it is not so important. But there is a sub community who know this crystallographic surfaces very well. Yeah. So it's like cutting off a crystal at a different angle. Okay. All right. I think I can remember that. Hopefully. Okay. Good. So you could relabel these layers with Miller indices? Exactly. Yes. Oh, equivalent, equivalent statements. Okay. Uh huh. Yes. Wait. Okay. One more time. What? You can, yeah. For you. What do you, you say? Define each layer as Miller indice planes. You keep getting quiet. I don't hear <laughs> you. <laughs> Miller indices. Okay, I don't know what that is, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> you, if, if anyone asks, you refer him or her to Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>
Um, so, okay, um, I mean, I guess that makes sense on why there's a specific network that's created between, um, I can't see my data because it, I can only see it on the, there because here it gets all jumbled. Um, but there's a network that's created between the, uh, the um, okay, let me start over. So this line here is a bunch of the bond distances between the sulfur and then the proton that's connected to it, which is relatively uh, stable. It doesn't change much depending on where it is. It's pretty much always just, I think it's like 1.2, 1.7. 1.7-ish, I don't know, it's somewhere in there. I'll remember that for next time. Um, but what it's saying is that this network is a decrease in the distance between the, like, kind of the three or the two bonds. So that it's kind of coming closer to create either a conversion back to thiol or a conversion to thiolate. Um, pretty much it's just showing that there's a connection between the, the proton and then the, both the sulfurs that it's near. All right, um, and then moving on to the projected density of states. Um, this first graph is showing uh, a comparison between uh, propylamine with no amine and then propylamine with amine. Um, what we're looking for here is a trap state, and those aren't going to occur with these three because it's only passivated by one ligand. Uh, so that's just, you're not going to have one ligand overpower quantum dot. Um, but this is full passivation, and we'll talk about that later where trap states come into play. Uh, but basically, what we don't want is for this ligand value, this green value, to be in front of the red value, um, because that means that this is the homo and this is the lumo, so that when it transfers, it's going to transfer from a lig like if it transfers from a ligand to a quantum dot, that is not what we want, and that could create a trap state. Um, and then, uh, but. What we do want is it from, to transfer from the quantum dot to the quantum dot. Um, so in this one, you can see that the with no amine and uh, propylamine, the uh, the distance is like it moves up further towards the quantum dot, which could potentially tra create a trap state um, if there was more than one thiol. Uh, so it's showing the necessity for amine and propylamine. And then in this one. Um, you can see that the no amine versus amine for acetonitrile is hardly any different. Um, acetonitrile does move it closer to the uh, band gap, but not, it's not super dramatic. And then this last one is just showing the difference between uh, no amine and propylamine and no amine and acetonitrile, just kind of emphasizing the difference that um, it's necessary to have amine in propylamine, but not in acetonitrile. Uh, in order to not create trap states. And then down here we have the fully passivated by thiol and fully passivated by thiolate. Um, a thiol network is when the thiols are interacting with each other, or shoot, Levi? Yeah. <laughs> a thiol network, is that with it, it's interacting with the surface or is it with each other? Um, so, I would say when they're interacting with each other, kind of okay. like hydrogen bonding. Okay, okay, because I followed your model, so yeah. Um, so there's a thiol network, which is uh, the green, it's both greens. Um, and you can see that in, um, that in a, uh, propylamine, the um, thiol is closer to the quantum dot, uh, and then the seed nitro has moved back slightly. Uh, which means that the optical properties could potentially be better in uh, the acetonitrile for thiol than in propylamine. Um, however, in uh, for the thiolate, the fully passivated by uh, thiolate with the proton, uh, there is not a huge change whether or not it's in different solvents. Um, the peak is relatively like it's significantly higher for um, for acetonitrile, but I'm not really sure what that affects, but basically this could create a trap state, um, which would cause a uh, decrease in, its, um, of, like, in the optical properties. And then, okay, so um, the absorption- uh, uh, Lisa, before you go on to the op uh, optical properties, mm -hmm. uh, is there any connection between the projected density of state and the optical properties? Oh, did I not explain what trap state was? 
Okay. No, you, you did, but a lot of the time you said this could make a trap state. Well, because well, I don't really... I think, <laughs> I think for the full passivated with thiolate and proton, the, uh, the fifth graph on the bottom one that you just talked about. Yeah, this one? That, yes. If we compare the states there and the optical properties, we know that it's a trap state because the oscillator strength dies. Yeah. There is very little oscillator strength. So okay. for that one, you don't need to say we, it could. You could okay. say this has a trap state and it can be shown in the optical properties. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, and then um, the absorption spectra. So uh, for propylamine, you can see that the uh, first is it would it be pro like proper to say transition or what is the correct word? Optical transition. Yeah, sure. transition would work. Okay. Uh, the first transition uh, is further like is requires less energy. Uh, but is a very big dim transition or has a small oscillator strength. Whereas for the first transition for the thiol is relatively bright um, compared to the thiolate. So that shows that the optical properties of thiol are uh, better than the optical properties of thiolate. Um, but for acetyl nitrile, you can see that the, uh, the thiolate is pushed significantly back further, um, but the oscillator strength is uh, brighter than the trans first, uh, um, first transition state there. Um, I'm still working out the details on this because I, I don't really know how to explain it very well. Um, but basically what I think is happening is that there is no, in when you're fully passivating it with thiolate, there's no conversion from thiolate back to thiol like there is in propylamine. So it like stays um, as thiolate and so the, um, optical properties are lessened uh, by that, and then the thiol properties pretty much stay relatively the same, um, which just shows what we knew is that thiolate is not um, beneficial to the quantum dot, um, and that even a mixture of between thiol and thiolate might not even uh, help the optical properties of it. And then uh, this is basically just uh, restating uh, what uh, this was stating as far as this is excited states, though. Um, you can see that the um, it's uh, the whole. Oh my gosh! Okay, one second. The NTOs are uh, centered sl uh, slightly around the quantum dot. Um, at, well, more around the quantum dot, uh, and then it moves to the quantum dot, and that's the case for uh, both both solvents. And then for uh, propylamine and acetyl nitrile for thiolate, you can see this bottom layer. Um, is like below layer D, so that's like right here. Uh, so it's centered completely on the ligands and then it moves to the quantum dot, which is a trap state. Um, so basically, um, the polarity of the, of the solvent reduces the likelihood that a trap state will be created um, from thiolate. Um, yeah, I have to work on the conclusions, but I have all my data. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think that's. What are the uh, TOs? What? The TOs? I guess Sorry. I'm familiar with like the homo and lumo, but the hodo and, t and ludo I've never seen before. Okay, um, this is brand new to me, uh, like, so I'm not going to explain it very well, so if somebody wants to take over after I've explained it, that would be great. Um, so what I have gathered from it is that this is uh, the electron hole, and that this is where it goes to once it's excited. That's very basic, but I don't know. Oh, that's right. We're talking about the acronym. Like, what's the actual? Wait, wait. Oh, uh, it's like the word means like yeah. oh, H, H O is highest occupied. Transitional orbital. Transitional. Yeah, transition, transitional, transition orbital. So I guess what would a transition orbital be? Because I guess I'm, I'm thinking about that physically, and I guess I don't know how to interpret that. Jabot and Levi are expected to know it. <laughs> Jabot, do you want to explain it? So in homo lumo means in ground state. In Wait, talk loud so I can hear too. <laughs> homo lumo is, is like in ground state. Okay. Orbital. So this one is in excited state orbital. In this state, electron in the actually in, hotel, in low two, 
and hotu means is like whole is like empty is a partially positive but in homo lomo um homo in the ground state and lotu is just empty of it all no so uh, 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 yes uh you were saying that you know mo's correct yeah so what is the mo it's the i guess the state of the electron or the states that the electrons are occupying okay how do you create a mo you mean like it's a linear combination or... of atomic orbital What's so, that? An MO is a linear combination of atomic orbitals, yes? Right, yeah. So I guess I'm not seeing like how you like what a transition orbital so, would be instead. Um transition orbital uh is a version of MO where the atomic orbitals are now the molecular orbitals and the molecular orbitals that go into the transition orbital, which is a linear combination in sense, is uh those are the ones that contribute to the transition. So when you solve your TDFT, you get uh, percents of various pairs of uh, occupied orbitals and unoccupied orbitals that make up the transition. And what an NTO does is it reduces the number of like molecular orbitals that you plot. Because for like a, a charge transfer, excitation you might have 10 or 15 pairs of orbitals that kind of you to that state but when you do the nto analysis you kind of convolute them into almost non-physical orbitals but now they are there's only a very select few that you need to plot to see the transition so would it be does like that make sense saying like this is kind of where the electron is taken from and this is kind of where it goes yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. that that's what the interpretation is but if he wanted to know what it is that's more what it is does that make sense i think so yeah so you're basically just you're only really looking at the the particular pieces of the orbitals that are actually active in the transition more or less? Yeah, in a, in, in a sense. You okay. you take the molecular orbitals that you are doing a linear combination to get the transition, yep. and you like convolute them into a lower, lower number of orbitals. Are you talking about like a mathematical convolution? Or like, because I, I, when I hear convolution, like I think, you know, like F star G. <laughs> Overlap. Okay, uh, I, I'm, I ha have not read through the paper that describes it in mathematical detail. Okay. But you, you, you change the orbitals, so you do like a change in basis. Okay, so it does I sound think. like that's probably the same thing then. Sure. I don't know. <laughs> and then I'll work on my conclusions. Yeah. And, then... and we still have a chance to ask something from Alyssa. I think that went a lot better than the Quick. first time. <laughs> <laughs> so more questions one, more questions two, more questions three. Let's thank Alyssa once again. And if you were writing feedback, please submit it to her. Let's guess who's next, Lizzie. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess my screen is really bad. Let's guess who is next. Ben? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Levi, what do you see? Uh, I see. I see half the screen. Okay. Okay, yes. there we go. I see it too. Thank you.
So Two. my. Oh. Sorry. Oh, you gave me honorable right to distribute. <laughs> I did. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So my research is on single wall single wall carbon nanotubes and uh, covalent functionalization thereof. Um, so we're interested in tuning the optical properties, uh, aka the emission properties of uh, single wall carbon nanotubes for applications to uh, say telecommunications or. Uh, single photon emission. Um, and to do that, uh, there are many ways to do it. Uh, first of all, uh, carbon nanotubes are created um, uniquely by two indices, N and M, that dictate the chirality of the carbon nanotube. Um, and with this chirality come different electronic properties and physical properties. Um, and so the optical properties can be tuned simply by changing the chirality and therefore the diameter of the tube. Another way to do this uh, more recently is covalent functionalization of the carbon nanotube um, for uh, more, more specific or fine tuning, I guess you could think about it as. Um, so what we're doing is we're taking a bunch of different groups, uh, a bunch of different functional groups, um, and covalently attaching them to the surface of a carbon nanotube um, to cause a hybridization defect so from sp2 to an sp3 type uh, hybridization uh, and we'll need to uh, do two defects on the carbon nanotube at a time to complete uh, to uh, get away from the open valence uh, just doing one and uh, we'll also do this uh, with so with different groups but we'll also do it in different orientations as you can see here um, we denote three vectors the plus the plus plus and the minus directions. Uh, so you can see them here by the red, the green, and the blue arrows. Uh, and we can, so there's three, and so we can define them also as ortho and as para. So you can go adjacent or across the ring. Um, and it, it has been shown if you jump farther than one ring, uh, the optical property, or the, yeah, the absorption and emission properties die off very quickly, uh, the farther away the defects are from each other. Um, and so some of the groups that were studied here, uh, so small methyl groups with an attached hydrogen, um, and you can also do two methyl groups, or you can jump to more electronegative groups uh, with a higher dipole moment, such as CF3. Um, and we've also uh, modeled long chain alkyl groups, so C6, uh, H13, and F13, uh, as well as three aryl functionalizations be a, a bromine on the pair position and five fluorine atoms um, in place of the four hydrogens. So the first thing that we looked at was uh, the band gap change uh, with respect to the functionalization. Um, so I have ordered the, the axis in uh, least change to most change. And so most change would be the most reduced band gap or the most redshifted band gap. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the O plus direction, so the ortho uh, in the direction of the chiral angle uh, shows the least change in the band gap uh, with any functionalization. And you can see the most is the P plus, so just jumping across the ring instead of uh, adjacent shows the most shift, so the most redshifted band gap. And to kind of illustrate that, Kind of hard to see here, uh, but uh, if we look at the pristine tube, uh, obviously all of the uh, the homo and lumos of defected tubes will be pushed up into the band gap. Um, you can attribute that partially to uh, the loss of symmetry in the carbon nanotube, um, and also you can attribute it to a uh, kind of an inductive uh, localization of the wave function near, or the electron density near the defect, or on the defect in some cases. Um, and you can see it as, as I continue ordering them in the same fashion, uh, they get smaller and smaller, so the homo and, luto get, or homo and lumo get closer and closer together. Um, and so I'd show... Can, can I interrupt and ask? Yes. So, um, assume that I'm seeing it for the first time. You're not far from really. So, in your center, Top panel, your x axis is O plus P minus O plus plus P plus plus O minus P plus. 
and on your uh, left definition of orientation, you explicitly label only O minus O plus and O plus plus. Where are you? I apologize for silly question, but where are P minus, P plus, and P plus plus? Well, yeah, I verbally stated that I can extend these three directions across the ring in each of the directions that I have shown here. Can you make help for uh, people with limited abilities? Sure. Uh, like <laughs> and, and explicit put like P plus, P sure. minus. Okay, thank you. I think I was done explaining the molecular orbital chain. Um, so then we can look at something else. Uh, we can look at the, the binding energy of these defects. Uh, so since we don't know the mechanism uh, to create these defects, so we do, we need to know the enthalpy of the, the reaction. The enthalpy mm. the <laughs> and, and whatnot. Um, we can't compare across different uh, defect groups, but we can compare across different defect orientations within the same group. And so I'll, I'll define the, the relative binding energy as um, the total energy of the system at a, at, the, at, a, at a given defect, one through six, at industry one through six, minus the minimum defect of those six orientations. And so that gives us kind of a relative to each other with respect to orientation around the ring uh, of this defect. Uh, and so it's kind of a mess. Uh, not 100% sure, sure if there's a lot to interpret from it uh, because it's very sensitive. Uh, so all of my, or many of my uh, defects are very flexible and, and require many different uh, orientations in space with respect to the two and with respect to each other. So um, it's very touchy. As you can see, I've kind of omitted a couple points because uh, I'm not sure if they're all following the same exact configuration in space, because uh, they give quite a bit different binding energies. Um, well, they'll be maybe like plus three electron volts or plus 10 electron volts or something crazy, even even uh, calculated using the same uh, functional and basis set uh, with optimization. Uh, so I'm not sure what to, what to do there, so I'll have to think about that some more. Um, but then, so we can look at the absorption energy. Um, pretty trivial, it looks just like the, the band gap. So uh, the absorption energy, so the, the E11 star peak, I should say, um, uh, of the absorption spectra for each of the defect orientations uh, follows or tracks the band gap change uh, for the ground state geometry. And I've just showed a couple, couple six instead of the 16 or whatever that I have uh, total, but uh, they all follow the same path. And so, we can draw some conclusions from this. Um, so we've applied uh, density functional theory and time-dependent density functional theory to analyze the optical properties um, and band gap properties of uh, single wall carbon nanotubes uh, with uh, different defect groups and different defect orientations. And so what we can say is that um, the orientation effects outweigh the group effects by a factor of about 10 a whole magnitude. Um, and so the orientation effect you can see here, if I take uh, kind of a, a, an, an average uh, from the P plus to the O plus, I get about 0.24 electron volts, so that's 10 times uh, background thermal energy for uh, room temperature. Um, and group effects uh, come up for uh, 0017 electron volts, so it's a little, uh, <coughs> a little less. So. Uh, we can say also that basis set size does not affect the trends in the band gap energies, um, as it was calculated with Sto3G, 321G, 631G star. Uh, they all show the same trends uh, with minimal difference. Um, and by extension, we can say that the, the E11 shifts, the E11 star shifts, um, also track uh, with different basis sets, uh, uh, with different uh, uh, orientations and groups. Obviously, with the fluorines, you get different energies, um, but not enough to outweigh um, the actual orientation effects. So, the trend is still the same. All right, and that's about it. That's a vote.
how do you like to please Britain with friendly questions? I have a line of silly questions. So you may have mentioned or implied that you want to do telecommunications and you need some specific frequency. In your last absorption energy, which is probably a shift of absorption energy, you do, you have ordered your groups oriented differently and, and uh, chemically different as uh, ascending of the change in uh, optical transitions. First, which of these optical transitions, which of these changes, which of these energies is uh, coinciding with uh, most popular telecommunication frequency? What is your target? What is your goal? When you stop your search and you'll tell, okay, well, go to engineers. I guess the quick answer to that would be, uh, doesn't matter, all we're interested in is the fine tuning of the, the properties themselves. So we can leave it up to the engineers to uh, use what we find here. Okay, so you don't care about uh, telecommunication standards, you just... I do personally don't care. So basic, basic science exploration. Yeah. Uh, second question. Um, there are some people in uh, this audience who want to continue this um, project in sense of removing and cleaning when a synthetic procedure deposits your different groups in a distribution of different orientations and for applications you need only one mono homogeneous distribution. So one may want to remove all unnecessary defects by burning them out, by irradiating them and making them to peel off. But in order to do so, it should be highly selective. Each of the defects should uh, be respond, uh, respond to a very specific frequency. But your change in frequency is small enough in electron volts is comparable to thermal and also most likely all your calculations were done at 0k at frozen geometry so uh, how you, what is your expectation you may have not computed anything in this direction but how this change in uh, frequency how your ability to control tuning of the frequency will stand if the models experience nuclear reorganization uh, real temperatures? Well, yeah, I figure uh, the group effects will be nominal at best uh, with the groups I've explored. Does that not answer the question? <laughs> I admire <laughs> the brilliant. <laughs> Any more uh, questions that you will entertain, Brayden? It's just a super simple question, but it's uh, most likely that that defects are never going to create like a like a good change in the nanosphere. Like it's always like the absorption energy is always going to be higher for the pristine than for the defect of the ion. Is there a question associated? It, I just is that is that am I thinking about it right? Yes. Whenever you well, whenever you whenever you defect a, a pristine tube, uh, the band gap will reduce, uh, and the uh, absorption, the even one star absorption, will get okay. <laughs> Why? What? Why? Why? Well, you have. Uh, well, you first break the symmetry, so. Uh, you have some, some orbitals that get pushed up into the band gap. That could be a reason for that. Um, but also you have a localization of the electron density uh, near, nearer to the defect rather than delocalized across the tube. And, that is and is there a simple model that can be used to describe that? Are you, do you mean like the infinite square well type model? Or what do you... 
Yeah, like a park in a box, right? Or that, okay. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yes, same thing. Yep. Okay. I have another question. Uh, so for the, like, the direction, like, does that, what does it look like? I know that's, like, the defect, like, what is the defect supposed to, is it, like, I can't picture it. <laughs> yeah. The, the vectors. Uh, the vectors I get, the, the defect, like, how does it, like, how does Why it align with the... Why do you say defect Oh well, yeah. Sure. Okay. So is it structural or is it defecting the electronic hybridization defect? Yeah. Well, yeah. Like like I said, it, it, it's a covalent attachment to a carbon that is on the surface of the tube, right? Um, so all the carbons on a pristine tube are more or less sp two hybridized, and so when you attach a covalent group, uh, it shifts that to sp three hybridization. So I've kind of very crudely shown that um, in this figure here. So I have two attachments. If I'm looking at the tube kind of horizontally, I can put two attachments on the tube. And so the, the carbon atom attached attributed to the tube would actually pop out a little bit. So it's like it's like sticking out of the tube then. Yeah. Okay. And then like it just like rotates depending on the back there. Okay. Got it. So you wanted just uh, visual models. Yeah, I think it would be nice just to see it, like a pretty picture of it. Yeah. He's making the visual model. <laughs> Or something like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then so like it has like a something on the top that like is like in a specific direction. Otherwise, if it's just sticking out, then why does it matter what direction it is? Um, the wrong. I, I will not damage this again and again. But you can do you can uh, roll so that it will be along the axis. Okay. You, you can roll so that it will be <laughs> orthogonal to the to the to the axis. Oh, okay. And you, you can you can do it at some crazy angle. Okay. And uh, this, uh, according to Brennan, it will um, noticeably affect their optical problems. Yes. Indeed. Okay. So you may do something like this on your actual poster. Do you think? Well, I mean, Svetlana gave me the idea to uh, show all of the different groups that I'm doing, kind of. In a model like this, do you think it would be more beneficial to just make a small table of all the different? Not a table, just do model like physical model. Yeah, but I mean to make. Not, not all of them, just just pair to show orientation. Yeah, because I mean I would get it like this is that makes sense. It, I would get it if it was just a picture, one picture. And, um, but do you think reducing this, like all these group names, to a smaller section and making a little? A larger section for one of those pictures would be no, not the, not the not the pictures. You you mount a poster and then you will hold a model, three dimensional model in oh, your hands. Oh, an actual model. Yes. Yeah. Oh. And it doesn't need to be high quality. You can like roll a piece of paper and put. Okay. Why you choose this compose all functionalization groups among these tons of other groups? Yeah, our initial thought was. Um, Though if you have a greater dipole moment on the group, uh, you'll see a larger shift, which is true, uh, just nominally. Um, and then our extension to that was um, if you have two, uh, two groups next to each other that are both highly um, uh, repulsive, right? So they're both long chain fluorinated alkyl groups, say. Um, we thought maybe the, the, the Coulomb repulsion between groups would also have, a, have an effect on the optical properties. But it just uh, kind of falls back down to the dipole moment. So that just an increased dipole moment is a little bit larger shift than the one. So you start with strongest electronic derivative elements, fluorine, right? Yes, that so was. Yeah. That's the reason. That was. Strong. So that means if fluorine doesn't work, that means nothing couldn't make it change. Yeah. Of of simple alkyl groups, yeah. Unless some different physics came into play other than dipole. More questions to Britain? Let's uh, award she is with a vote once again. Many thanks for uh, coming here and doing this uh, presentation once again. Please don't forget to submit your feedback to authors and um,
if we are not doing the following activity in the organized way, but please uh, pay an attention to the procedure of printing posters. Uh, if the simplest thing is just print by your own and then request reimbursement, but then you need to put something out of your, of your pocket. There is a simpler procedure. You ask uh, experienced people who were doing it previous year, and they will advise you how to approach Annette. Who is Annette? I guess Amy can pick up. Okay, whatever. Yeah. Start with A. <laughs> and few little Don't go to Annette. Huh? Don't go Amy. to Annette, go to Amy. She, yeah. She'll help you. <laughs> okay. And uh, with the piece of paper that will have uh, information about, like, uh, advisor, grant number, you will go to the uh, QBB first floor, and they have a poster pr printing facility where you give this uh, piece of paper, give memory stick or send them email with, uh, you better have both PDF and uh, PowerPoint of the poster. And uh, then you promise to complete it in, in 24 hours. It, in, in fact, it takes much, much shorter time, but plan to do it early enough. The best time to submit your posters for printing will be like Wednesday evening, so that you do not, do not feel uh, nervous. Okay? So uh, talk to each other, uh, concentrate collective intelligence. That's it. Uh, have a safe travel. I, uh, I hope everyone has set uh, flights, place to live, and way to, of transportation to the airport here and to the hotel there. Right? Is there anyone who is not set? Uh, <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, Braden was. Going to ask something. I was just yeah. curious why uh, why you and Svetlana aren't giving posters this year. Who is giving posters? Or who is not giving posters? You and Svetlana. What? Are you not giving posters this year? No. Why? I'm just curious. Um. Did I get a poster last year? <laughs> you did. No. Uh, you signed up, but it was Julian. It doesn't Yulin. matter who is uh, oh. in the schedule. I see. <laughs> I thought it would be something more important about organization <laughs> as a group, but thank you for the interest to my humble person. Hey, Levi? <laughs> yes? Are you going to send me your poster or are you going to print it from there? Yeah, I'm going to send you it. I just have to finish uh, the last few things. When are you going to print yours? <coughs> <laughs> you know, Friday morning. What morning? Friday morning or maybe Thursday. Okay, I'll send it to you probably tomorrow night. Okay. Then I will take a form for you from Amy. Is that okay? Or you will not email here? Email her. I think uh, you can get it. Okay. Well, many thanks to everyone. And uh, the adjourn is announced.